The Monerotopia Price Report segment is sponsored by Local Monero. Avoid using KYC exchanges. Buy and sell Monero directly for fiat peer to peer. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? What's going on, man? I'm great. Hope you all had a wonderful well, Friday evening. Yeah, we did. We did. Thanks for um, contributing so much to the last spaces. That was awesome, man. You were great. Yeah, that was fun. Yeah, good stuff. I, uh, I liked the guest. That was, that was some good back and forth, and you were dropping some good Monero information. There were some a lot a lot of people, uh, I guess that were that are his followers are are B cashers, right? Did you get that that sense? Yeah, yeah, it seemed that way. <laughs> I like how we have kind of an even mix of both um, people that came from maximalism and uh, other people on the Bcash side. It's like, what's the one thing they can all agree on? Apparently, it's Monero. Exactly. Exactly. So I've got a lot of stuff for you guys today. I'm going to try and um, fly through some of the stuff that we've covered previously. And then at the end, we're going to talk about Binance. Um, That's a lot of stuff going on with that. Um, A bunch of things coalescing at once. So, uh, And I, I don't think any of us necessarily... Uh, Binance isn't necessarily our favorite number one exchange to go to, um, and they could be on the ropes. It looks a lot like they're on the ropes. Uh, but let's go ahead and start with uh, you know where we're familiar, which is Monero. So we're basically hanging out still in the same channel. Um, we recently tested uh, the bottom side of this trend right here, which is um, not too surprising. Um, you, you'll notice that I kind of redrew this top line a little bit. It's, it's hard to draw a clean line. And maybe one of these days I'll kind of go over my preferences on how you draw lines, because I think it's really easy to get that wrong. It's really easy to kind of like try and make a bunch of rules. And there's, um, believe it or not, there's actually a lot of nuance to it. And you have to understand how to use trend lines properly, because otherwise it can be somewhat deceptive uh, or it can be kind of misleading uh, from time to time. So I, uh, in line with that, I actually um, deleted a lot of my lines on on the Monero chart and redrew a few of them. So um, let's take off some of these shorter term. There we go. So um, essentially what we're looking at here is kind of a wedge structure. Now, the bottom line down here is not necessarily, you know, as strong as you would want it to be. Maybe you'd want to see another um, another point, but it doesn't really connect well with anything. Maybe you could connect it to there, but, you know, that's that's a little bit dubious. But the point is that this looks a lot to me like a bullish wedge. Um, these sideways wedges can sometimes be bullish or bearish, um, but this looks like we're getting close to a breakout. And this actually is not too, dif- um, too different than the wedge that we had on Monero XMR BTC. So um, this big, uh, you know, this big wedge that we had going on for, for really years. Um, but uh, the wedge that we're looking at on XMR USD looks similar to that. And I really do think we're going to break to the upside um, at some point. That could take until next year. You'll notice that these lines don't converge until somewhere around like the end of Q2 next year. So it's possible that we could come down here, test the bottom of that range. Um, As I've been saying, I've been expecting that before we get a big breakout next year, we have one more pullback to happen. And I think that pullback has already started. So, um, uh, oh, the other thing that I thought was kind of cool is that um, and this is kind of in line with, with things you can do when you're drawing trend lines. So we just connected the very absolute tippy top points there. And you can just drag this line down here. And you'll notice that uh, it, it connects a lot of very interesting points. So we've got all those guys right there. Um, we had these recent points. And so even though you have to kind of slice through the tops of these peaks here, when you're dealing with stuff like crypto that's so volatile, it's, it's kind of okay to do that. Um, and probably y'all have noticed on the Bitcoin and total charts that I draw, I do kind of the same thing. So, um, you know, again, overall big picture here, Monero price looks great. Um, it looks like this is fundamental organic support. It's hard to believe that we can get much below this area right here. I, I, maybe they can drive price down below here. Like let's suppose Binance collapses or something, right? Um, maybe we can take a big spike down. Um, but ultimately I believe it or not, I think that Binance collapsing would be good for Monero's price in the long run. Although there would probably be short-term price pain. All of the other coins are going to have like serious problems if finance collapses. Um, they're they're going to have a huge crash yeah. um, and it's going to be a lot harder for them to recover. Uh, but Monero, I think is, is going to have easier times. So here's the divergences. Um, these are all the prices compared to Kraken. And you'll notice uh, Binance in red. Uh, we This week, they had a really big divergence to the downside simultaneous with Qcoin going to the upside. So I'm going to add some horizontal um, lines here because I want to show you that we haven't had this much divergence 
since August when uh, when Binance suspended withdrawals. Uh, here we go. Yeah, so this is August. Um, and you can see they did it for much longer than they did um, recently. So recently it was just kind of like one spike down. But this is when Binance shut down withdrawals for 10 days in August um, while the rest of crypto pumped. And then Monero price mysteriously stayed flat and capped as Binance diverged their prices below Kraken. Um, so you can see that we haven't had this much divergence since August um, on Binance. And I don't know why it is, but for whatever reason, it seems like that's correlated with Qcoin having a positive divergence from Kraken. So who knows what's going on there? Um, and by the way, this is also the volume adjusted um, divergence. So if you don't make the volume adjustment, the, the price doesn't look so much different. Um, Binance only diverged down by about a quarter of a percent. But the thing is, they did a lot of volume down there, right? So that's kind of the big thing that you want to look at. How much real volume are they doing at prices lower than Kraken? Um, we've got the uh, longs and shorts basically uh, flat, not, not anything changed there. And um, as we talked about, this chart is the Monero dominance and, you know, posing a little bit of challenges right here. But, you know, we'll, we'll see. We'll see if this thing can just break to the upside. Um, I don't necessarily have any um, huge opinions on whether we need. I mean, it, you know, naturally, you would say that this chart should pull back because this has been such a long term resistance. But, uh, you know, sometimes crypto can surprise you. Perhaps this could just break out to the upside. Um, and then Monero Bitcoin is, uh, you know, just chugging along. Looks good. We're still in this kind of rising wedge structure. And you'll notice that this week uh, we had a pullback, just uh, like we were talking about last week. This 009 level is going to be a little bit difficult to get through. Um, but ultimately, you can see what happened here. That was just a wick. All we did is wick down for just a moment. And then we came right back up uh, to the top side of this wedge. So um, really, this wedge could very easily break to the upside, you know, something like that, and then, and then go up. Um, at least, you know, the, the hopeful in me would, would think that that could happen. Um, so that's Monero. Um, let's go ahead and take uh, a big uh, zoom out picture. Oh, you know, one thing I wanted to mention. Um, so if you're on Twitter spaces, uh, tune in to YouTube and you can see all the charts that I'm talking about. And when you do that, make sure that you change your resolution from 360p to 720p. Otherwise, your charts are going to be fuzzy and it's going to be kind of hard to make out the resolution. Um, so I want to cover something again that we covered last week, and I, I think I could have done a little bit better job explaining it. So this is the M2 money supply. This is all cash, coin, checking, savings, and all time deposits of less than one year. And you'll notice that this chart has, uh, you know, very, very quickly, you can eyeball that it looks like an exponential chart. Um, and on the right side, you can see we're on a natural scale, which means that each of these increments is the same. So plus one trillion, plus one trillion, plus one trillion. Um, now, the reason for this is because of compounding interest. So the United States Central Bank, right, the Federal Reserve, and all central banks, they target inflation as a percentage. Um, and so when you're dealing with percentages, you're dealing with inherently an exponential process. And so this is the equation for compound interest. Um, and this is discreetly compounded. So like, for example, let's suppose you had 12% interest per year and you compounded that once per month. So that would be 1% per month. Um, this is the equation that you would use, and you'll notice that there's an exponent here. Um, and then if you were to compound continuously, so like every second of every day, you know, you divide that that 12% um, across, you know, a million seconds or however many there are in a year, you would end up with an equation that looks like this. This is the, the simplified version of continuously compounded interest. And this is much closer to what um, overall in aggregate the economy does. And you'll notice that um, we have, this is an exponential function. And so Inflation, by targeting it as a percentage, is uh, inherently an exponential function. So that's why you have an exponential process right here. And now we use the log. We come over here and we click logarithmic because it translates that exponential function into something that's, uh, that's actually linear. Um, and so, like, for example, notice that we have E, uh, which is 2.72. Um, you would use a natural logarithm to deal with, um, with this exponent here. So logarithms are how we deal with exponent, uh, exponents. And you can notice that this basically turns what was uh, previously um, an exponential chart into um, a linear chart. So um, the short version is that uh, we're translating out of, um, you know, this kind of exponential curve into something that's linear. Um, and that's a lot easier to analyze. So just kind of recovering, again, why we use log charts. There's, uh, you know, of course, you get better resolution on the lower time frames, or sorry, on longer time frames, but uh, it's just mathematically appropriate to do. Um, and you want to use uh, log charts, particularly on assets priced in U.S. dollars. Um, other assets, like, for example, um, we're going to look at the inflation now. Um, 
you know, we wouldn't put this on a log chart because this is not priced in U.S. dollars. This is just a percentage of what the inflation was year over year. Um, so don't let this part, uh, don't let this chart fool you. These, um, the inflation numbers come out once a month. So TradingView just connects these dots uh, to, uh, you know, to make it look like a smooth chart. So last week we just got the inflation numbers um, and this was the last, the last numbers that we had before it was right here. Now you can see that they came down just a little bit. Uh, which is good. This is what we want to see. Um, federal, the Federal Reserve Chair Powell was talking about, okay, this is good. You know, we want to see this trend continue. Um, this, this isn't like any huge, you know, drop in inflation. So you'll notice that core inflation, which they look, you know, primarily that's the most important, uh, the most important thing that they look at. Um, so it's, it's basically all goods or it's all inflation minus energy and food. So the thing is, we need to see this continue. This trend needs to continue for the next, say, month, like at least two months, one or two months. And that should set us up pretty well for the markets to actually to pump next year if this continues. Um, so they were, you know, cautiously optimistic about it. Um, but essentially, these were kind of neutral numbers, right? Like it came down, not by a lot. We're still kind of high. Overall, this was kind of a neutral picture on the inflation. Um, so this drove the Federal Reserve to raise by uh, half a point or 50 basis points, which is um, half a uh, percent. Um, and that's the white line right here. So the other lines here, these are all the, uh, the yields. So the different maturity length yields, yellow being the one year, uh, green is two years, so on and so forth. And you can see that we still have a full yield curve inversion here. So the Federal Reserve raised 50 basis points, which was pretty much what the markets were expecting. It's what the Fed said they were going to do. Um, so that also was fairly neutral. Now, there's something that I think people need to be aware of when it comes to these big economic releases. Um, I've seen in the past few months that there is increased volatility in cryptocurrencies, uh, perhaps more than there used to be um, previously this year. My theory on that is that crypto people are finally realizing how important these big macro numbers are and how correlated cryptocurrency is to traditional markets. And so it seems to me that it's likely that market makers and hedge funds, um, maybe exchanges are inducing artificial volatility um, in cryptocurrencies leading up to these big economic releases. For example, we saw positive action on Bitcoin and crypto in you know, like the week leading up to the Federal Reserve meeting. Um, there was big volatility that day before the meeting, uh, before the press release, there was a big pump in Bitcoin. And to me, it, it all looked pretty artificial. It didn't look real. It just, you know, uh, like for example, Monero didn't go up with it. And that's kind of a bellwether that, I, that I've started using because the exchanges are out of Monero. They're out, they're out of fake paper Monero to sell and people are withdrawing. So when there is organic buying, people are going to be buying Monero along with other cryptocurrencies. We've, we've basically made it into the general broad consciousness of the cryptocurrency ecosystem. So people know about Monero, they're buying Monero, they realize it's important. We're not some obscure coin anymore. So if there's real organic buying, Monero's price should go along with the rest of cryptocurrency when it pumps. But that's not what we saw going into these numbers. Monero didn't, um, didn't do hardly anything at all. Meanwhile, uh, you know, Bitcoin and some of these others pumped from 7, 10, 15%. So that didn't look real to me. And then sure enough, after they after the press release, um, things started crashing or really in the middle of it. So it's just something that if you're a trader out there, you, you just need to be aware that the market makers are probably very aware that crypto people are now trading these big economic releases. So don't let them catch you out with induced volatility is, uh, is kind of the lesson there. Um, there were some other numbers that came out like the unemployment. Um, you could see that uh, we're historically low. This chart goes all the way back to 1950. And you can see that um, this came out on Friday and we're still like three and a half percent, just just above three and a half percent. So um, if you listen to <laughs> Jay Powell talk, uh, which is kind of dry and difficult to do, but um, he talks about uh, unemployment being low and the demand for labor being so high is like basically the primary in their mind, the primary driver of, um, of inflation right now. So with the unemployment numbers being very low, that means that there's very high demand for labor and it means they have to pay their workers a lot higher. So that's a contributing factor to inflation. So overall, everything that we saw um, this week on these big economic releases, it was all neutral for the most part. Everything was kind of middle of the road, nothing nothing inspiring. Um, here's a new chart that uh, I wanted to show you guys. This is the um, single family homes, the uh, median uh, sales price. And you'll notice that it's very cyclical. Um, so starting in January, you typically get these, uh, these big pumps um, 
and you'll notice that uh, you know you kind of get this like sawtooth pullback action. So we're coming in here into January pretty soon, and um, you might expect that this would come up a little bit. So if you're like thinking about selling your house, you know you, now wouldn't be a bad time. Um, you know if you were already going to sell it. Uh, so that's kind of big macro view right there. Um, let's go ahead and uh, well, let's cover a few more macro things actually. So price of oil, um, we're in this kind of big megaphone pattern and oil is just kind of hanging out down here, which is really what we want. If oil can stay low, that's good. It was when we saw oil getting up here and the inflation started kicking off, that was, that was really bad for the stock market because again, it means that the Federal Reserve has to con, uh, contract and keep rates higher for longer. And, um, you know, that's that's not good for anyone that's holding a risk asset. So, um, oh, and then the reverse repo is also very important. We've seen them make a little bit of a recovery here. They've bounced to the upside. I don't think this will last for too much longer, but maybe we could go up a little bit higher. Um, again, I, I have been expecting a pullback, and I think that one more pullback needs to happen before uh, we have the opportunity to make a big bounce to the upside. Um, so let's get back to crypto then. Uh, don't want to get too boring on all the uh, dry macro analysis stuff. Um, this is what we're looking like. So I drew a couple new lines here. Uh, very big picture. This is total crypto market cap. And you can see that um, this line goes all the way back to 2015. Nice long trend line. And uh, you know we basically broke down from this line a few weeks ago. And I kind of wish I had seen this. I, I didn't catch this until recently. I was too zoomed in. Um, so ultimately we've broken through that line and honestly, I don't think it's going to be difficult to ever break this line again. Um, now that doesn't mean that we couldn't get close to it. That doesn't mean that, you know, in the future we couldn't push up here to three or $4 trillion again, maybe 2025, 2026, something like that. Um, but for the moment, this line is solidly broken and is now definitely going to be resistance if we can even get up that far in the first place. So, um, you'll notice that on a little bit shorter time frame. Um, you know, we've got this, our sort of descending channel right here, uh, and we're testing the bottom side of that line again. So, um, you know, will that line hold? Will it not? I don't know. It seems to be like a trend line that's overall, um, just kind of the market has continually followed it down. So it, I mean, I, I kind of do expect that we should spend some more time going down before we go back up. Um, the thing that will be bullish that will really like be a great sign is to break this line at some point. Um, if we can get above that line, because that's, you know, that's kind of been like the very top level limiter for total crypto market cap. Um, so Bitcoin looks almost the exact same way. Uh, in fact, it's got, you know, we basically we didn't quite get there, at least the way that I had this line drawn. Uh, we didn't quite get there, but it's really not surprising um, that that would have been a pullback here again. This is also on Wednesday when the Federal Reserve released their numbers, right? We we just had like this uh, a big pump, another big pump, a wick up, and then it dropped down. Like that's not good price action. Um, so, for example, in July when the Fed meeting came out, um, they announced, uh, you know, a, or oh, I'm sorry, it wasn't uh, it wasn't the Fed meeting. It was high inflation numbers, right? We had a, a big release on the inflation numbers. They were really high. Um, the market tanked on that news, but then by the end of the day, it had put on gains, right? It went from being a big red dildo to a big green dildo. Well, this is the opposite right here. We had a few big green dildos here and then it just totally reversed and went to the downside now. Um, so that's not bullish. That's that's actually pretty bearish. So, um, you know, just be aware. Now, at the same time, it's, you know, if you haven't already gotten out of this market, it's really hard for me to recommend that anyone sell <laughs> at this point. You know, the time to sell was in August. The, the time to sell was in April. Uh, but right now it's kind of like, uh, it's, you know, I, like I said, I've been expecting this pullback. I felt a little bit like I was playing with fire, you know, saying, well, you know, do I want to wait for another one? Maybe it's time to just get in now. Um, right now I'm feeling a little bit more comfortable with my decision to wait. So, um, I want to cover the, um, uh, the regression analysis, just a quick look. Um, so again, big picture, this is Bitcoin. The red line is like the absolute lowest low that we could expect Bitcoin might have, statistically speaking, right? This is not, a, it's, it's it's not like a fundamental analysis. It's just pure uh, statistics. So you can see that we're actually getting really close um, to my targets here. And that's another reason why I haven't, I haven't bought because a lot of crypto assets look exactly like this, where it's like my targets are like another 15% down. Uh, well, between let's say ten and twenty percent, ten and thirty percent down, and uh, it's like we've yeah, covered Bitcoin number there. So if we were what's to, that? If we were to hit the the bottom red line within the next month, like what's like the uh, 
the number bitcoin price uh that would be 14 just above 14,000 like if we crashed today that would be 14,370 is what it looks like mm -hmm. uh, and historically this line has been off by 5% so if you go back and you you check these other um spots down there it's been like up to 5 or 7% um you know error range in the past but yeah that would be like 143 and i would definitely buy like if we hit that i'm just going to be like <laughs> all right for, you know, fucking A. So, okay, there's another factor that uh, a buddy of mine brought to me, and I'd forgotten all about it. Um, it's the uh, it's the tax harvesting. Uh, it's kind of like that time of the year where people, uh, when they have losses on an asset, they say, "Well, screw it, I'm going to sell the asset. I'm going to realize the loss. I'm going to use that as a write off on my taxes." And a lot of assets have had a lot of losses this year, so um, it's it's actually like not surprising at all that the market would drop here, and it could continue dropping through the end of the year as people harvest their tax losses. Um, so it's kind of another good reason to be pretty careful. Um, the ideal situation to me would be for things to continue going down, maybe hit a low on the very last week in December, uh, maybe touch this this regression line down here, um, because after those tax losses are harvested. People are going to want to get back into those assets that because, you know, people most people don't like being out of the market. I, I don't like it. Um, I've you know kind of been uncomfortable here, but there's really no better place to be. Um, so but people, you know, they they want to get back into the assets that they believe in. So they might sell, realize that tax loss, write it off, and then they'll get right back into that asset um, on January 2nd, I think is is a Monday. Uh, so, yeah, that's the look on the on Bitcoin. That's kind of a, a good thing to keep in mind about about that tax harvesting. Now, another thing that I wanted to re to cover again, we we covered this last week, but I feel like it it wasn't visually presented um, as well as it could have been. So this is Bitcoin dominance, uh, and then you can see the orange line just overlays on top of Bitcoin dominance. So what we can do is we can subtract stable coins from that calculation. And you'll notice that moves the orange line up. So the orange line is the adjusted Bitcoin dominance when you subtract stable coins. Now, if we're being fair, we want to subtract other stuff like um, all of the lost Bitcoin, right? Which is something like 20, 25%. So we're only doing 15% right here. And you'll notice, you know, that kind of brings it back down a little bit. So um, maximalists are right when they say, hey, you know, it's without the stable coins, you know, Bitcoin dominance is doing better. Technically it is, but it's it's not huge. It's not like... As amazing as, as you would maybe hope uh, for it to be. So the other thing that we can look at is the Ethereum dominance um, and then the stablecoin dominance, which is in green. So um, now we can do things like adjust for the total value uh, locked in Ethereum. And I don't know why, but there's like some weird thing with TVL <laughs> today where this line just shot up. So just like just ignore that line. Uh, but anyways, yeah, so this is the picture that it looks like when you make some adjustments that, you know, probably should be made at the same time, everybody looks at this chart. <laughs> they don't look at the adjusted Bitcoin dominance. They just look at the straight up Bitcoin dominance. So um, it seems like it's kind of range bound. It, it looks like this chart is just going to be range bound down here for a while. Uh, had a little bit of a bump today. Maybe, I don't know, maybe we could make it to the top side here or maybe not. Um, I'm, I'm not so sure about that because uh, the ETH, the Ethereum Bitcoin chart looks pretty bullish overall. Um, so, oops, hang on a second. Okay, yeah, so this chart looks to me pretty bullish. Um, kind of hanging out here in this range, it's consolidating. There was this big move um, last year in the summer that brought ETH BTC significantly higher. And right now, I mean, this just looks like a chart that's gonna keep doing this. And at some point it's gonna break out. Probably it's gonna take until at least Q3, maybe Q4 of next year before this breakout happens. Um, or perhaps maybe the Gox coin have something to say about that um, next year when they, whenever they get released. So, um, I mean, Ethereum is bullish, like at least against Bitcoin. It's, there's a lot of reasons to think that Ethereum is going to be bullish versus Bitcoin. Um, like Monero, I think that it's possible that uh, Ethereum could basically double bottom here. So this was the bottom in July. You could double bottom down here, maybe. Um, that white line that you see here, this is the, uh, the lifetime moving average of Ethereum. So, um, yeah, anyways, um, there's there's reasons to think that Bitcoin dominance is not going to be making any huge breaks beyond 50 percent anytime soon. Uh, so let me check my notes here. Uh, yeah, the last thing, let's go ahead and take a look at some of the traditional markets. Um, S&P 500. Ethereum is, is looking bullish against Bitcoin. Um, Monero is looking bullish against Bitcoin. 
Is is Monero looking bullish against Ethereum? Uh, here's the XMR ETH chart. Um, we do have a nice uptrend going. Um, it currently is bullish. You could say that we're currently in a bull market versus Ethereum. And this trend line is just relentless. It just keeps going. Um, so in terms of statistical targets, you would you would say maybe this area right here, um, these uh, the moving average, like the lifetime moving average could be a spot. Um, if we do a measurement, that would put that would be about a, a 2x higher um, relative to Ethereum. You can see that let's switch to the weekly so we can get a better view. Uh, this area right here is just before just before the bull market took off and everything pumped and, and the relative value of Monero um, took a big hit. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, overall, it's there's every reason to think that this trend is going to continue. I don't I don't see any big, um, big problems. This this looks like a bullish uh, like if we went down here into lower time frames, we could probably find some more lines to draw and, you know, find some more some more reasons to feel uh, bullish about this. This is kind of a um, this is kind of a wedge structure right here. So, uh, again, so when you're in a bull market and you have a wedge structure, these things can very often be bullish. Normally, a rising wedge is going to be a bearish structure, but in a bull market, a rising wedge can be a bullish structure. So um, if you see us kind of popping up here and we hold this line, that that's a really good sign that we would probably end up making it all the way up to here. So nice. that's uh, one way you can think about Ethereum uh, Ethereum versus Monero or Monero versus Ethereum. Uh, okay, so we've got the S&P 500, the yellow line again, the dotted yellow line is the pre-COVID highs, which has been my targets for a long time. Um, the other thing is that uh, you can yeah. see that there is uh, momentum divergence. So we're making higher lows down here. Uh, let me expand that. We're making higher lows uh, on the momentum chart, which is a Z-score chart, even though we've been making lower lows the whole time. So um, it's really not surprising the pullback that happened recently. Uh, again, you've got your overall just bear market trend line. We touched it, touched it again, and fell down. So, um, you know, and again, this is this is kind of another one of those rising wedge structures. It's not as clean as you would want it to be, uh, but it is sort of essentially basically a rising wedge. And we fell out of that. So there is the opportunity now that this thing could actually finally touch the pre-COVID highs. That's That's my target. That's what I wanted. And just like I was saying, like everything has been hovering above my targets. My my long term targets have have been down here for a long time, and we only missed that by like three percent on the S and P. Uh, and the Nasdaq looks very similar. Um, we we basically how high above that were we? Seven percent. Uh, so we came within seven percent of that target, um, and I would really really like to get there, get close at least. Um, so there's a good chance that this happens, and um, but ultimately, again, I do think that next year, everything is setting up for a big rally. The Fed is almost done raising rates. They've got like another maybe 75 basis points to go. Um, they're they're going to just hold the rates they're steady and see what happens. Now, the thing that will weigh on the markets long term is that if the inflation numbers don't come down, the Fed is not going to be able to just lower rates. So we might get a big um, like a big rally next year. And then the market start uh, might start realizing like, oh, crap, you know, the Fed's they're sticking to their guns. They're not lowering uh, the interest rates. You know, maybe this thing could could go chop sideways for, I don't know, a year, two years. Um, who knows? But at the very least, I think that we are going to have a good opportunity to get in on a big move to the upside. Um, and if you play your cards right, you could probably take some profit at the top of that, um, you know, get a little bit back in the dollar, maybe some gold. Uh, so, OK, the last thing that I wanted to talk about was uh, Binance. So <laughs> there's. So much stuff happening with these guys. Uh, it seems like this last week there was there was a lot of new stuff that has been coming to light. Um, one thing is that, um, and so in no particular order, uh, Binance, uh, sorry, CZ got on CNBC and had this interview. And man, he he was like stammering. He was equivocating. He looked nervous. Um, he was saying like some really ridiculous things. The one that stood out in my mind, he says, um, in, in Binance, we are backed one to one. All our assets are backed one to one. And it's just like, you little liar. No, they're not. We know that you don't back Monero one to one. We have like all of the proof that we need. So, OK, like lie number one. Um, he said something else that was just dumb. He's like, the big four auditing firms don't know how to audit crypto, even though the fact that uh, Coinbase, for example, um, has, I think it's Deloitte, uh, Deloitte is their auditing firm, one of the big four. Um, the other thing is that um, 
So this company called Mazars, um, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but uh, they did the proof of reserves verification for Binance recently. Um, but then Mazars fired all of their customers. So Qcoin, Crypto.com and Binance. And they said that they're not going to be serving crypto exchanges anymore. And they removed their Binance report, um, which was not an audit. It was just a report on the proof of reserves. But they removed that report from their website. Um, so <laughs> Mazars ditched all of their crypto people. Uh, so that's that's not good. Um, I saw a chart that showed Binance's assets. More than 50% of their assets are either BNB coin or Binance USD. So <laughs> that's kind of the same situation that FTX had where like their own native token FTT represented the vast majority of their, yeah, of their alleged true. assets. Um, we have. Um, so what, what do you, do you think the likelihood is that they, you know, worst case? Like, Man, I don't know. Under. At first, I was like, if you'd asked me that a week ago or two weeks ago, I'm like, hey, pr probably not. I guess I, I don't want that to happen, but I kind of do want it to happen. Um, I would say it's they're on the ropes for sure. And maybe even CZ doesn't know. Like he's out there doing all the same stuff. He's acting the same way that freaking Sam Bankman was acting uh, before they went under. So, oh, you know, there's another big one here. Um, there is the potential that a clawback could happen on behalf of um, – of FTX. Mm -hmm. So in this chapter 11 bankruptcy proceeding, they can do clawbacks. Uh, like for example, uh, in the whole Bernie Madoff thing, people that through no fault of their own, were not involved in the scam. They had just taken profits uh, and they had gotten their money off of, um, you know, out of the Madoff scam. Those same people had their profits clawed back um, in the bankruptcy proceeding. Cause it's like, yeah, you, you benefited. Okay. You didn't commit a crime. You didn't know what was going on, but you don't deserve those profits. They should be distributed to everyone. Um, so who knows, you know, I'm not a lawyer, but um, it does seem like there could be some uh, pretext or a reason here for the bankruptcy proceedings on FTX to try and claw back that $2.1 billion um, that Binance when they sold off their FTT. Um, maybe that doesn't happen, but it's it's definitely not a zero risk like it could happen. And, and who knows, that could be a big thing. The, the last thing that I'll say about them is that um, the United States Injustice Department was considering charging Binance. They're like the the headline is that they're divided on whether or not they want to charge Binance uh, with crimes. Now, unfortunately, it's all like it's the usual crap, like unlicensed money transmission, laundering, conspiracy, violation of sanctions. But to me, it's like, what about the lying to their customers, the market manipulation, the coordinated fraud and the selective scamming of their customers? liquidating positions for people that were nowhere near their liquidation point. Like to me, that's the fraudulent stuff. They're like, they're harming people with all that. And, and I mean, I know that, you know, the licenses are supposed to, you know, like it rolls into all that, but like, I just, I hate that the government will focus on like their scribbles and like, well, you didn't get our permission and that's what we're going to prosecute you for. It's like, no, they harmed people by like stealing money from them. That's the fraudulent thing. So, um, yeah, the, the U.S. Injustice Department is considering charging them right now. Uh, and that's like an open headline at this point. So they've got a lot of stuff. Um, I don't think anyone here in Monero has their assets on Binance anymore. So I don't really need to tell anyone to pull your assets off there, you know, and preach into the choir. Uh, but it could have negative consequences for price, um, at least in the short term. And, hey, you know, that's fine. Let, let's get another little crash. I'd be happy with that. I'll let it back burn. Up let it my burn. Monero. Burn it down. Yeah. Down. We don't need them, you know. We, we would do better without them. Ultimately, I mean, the it's hard to. Yeah, you know, obviously, you feel bad for people that are, you know, that are involved in this, right? But yeah, we, we just get, we got to we got to wash these things out. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's what I've been saying since April fourteenth, twenty twenty one, is that this fraud has to get washed out for yep. crypto to be taken seriously, legitimately, and for price to sustainably, organically rise. Oh, well. <laughs> Hopefully that wasn't too much fire hose for everyone. That's great info. <laughs> As it, usual. It is epic, man. These price reports are epic. I never uh, for anybody them. that's listening on Twitter spaces, you know, obviously they're, they're better when you can see the, the charts. But we also post so we, it. We post um, it on separately. YouTube. You yeah, can watch so it live on YouTube as well, but then we post it separately on YouTube. So if you want to go back and watch the charts. People that are in the spaces, uh, go ahead and um, share this. Let's get it out there a little bit. Get some more people in the room. Um, we ready to move on? I think so. I think so. Anything else you want? Right. To say? Well, a lot of or... news. Bonnie, yeah. thanks so much, man. Uh, if thank you, you guys. Faces, if you can, uh, greatly appreciate. Yeah, it. I'll, right. I'm gonna try and make it. I, I might have to dip out, but uh, yeah, I'll try and be in the spaces later. on. Awesome. All right, awesome. Thank you once again for doing the price report. Really appreciate it. <laughs> thank you. All right, enjoy the rest of your weekend.
Adios. Adios. <laughs> Later. Later, man.